Welcome to this week's edition of The Left Bench TV. I'm Megan Smedley. And I'm Alex Flum. Our top story this week, reported first by The Left Bench, is about two Maryland football players. Star running back Lorenzo Harrison III and receiver DJ Turner have been identified as the suspects in the recent airsoft gun incidents here on campus. Each was charged with three counts of second-degree assault, three counts of reckless endangerment, and one count of threatening bodily harm to a student on campus. The two are suspended indefinitely. Max Marcilla is with our resident football experts, Jared and Jared, to discuss the incident and what this means for the team going forward. I'm joined today by Jared Goldstein and Jared Bellman. It's been a tough week in College Park for the Maryland football program as a pair of players, Lorenzo Harrison and DJ Turner, were in trouble and have been suspended indefinitely. So the big question around College Park, will Lorenzo Harrison and DJ Turner see time in the red, black, and gold? No, and I really hope I'm correct in that statement because DJ Durkin, first year head coach, he's got to set a precedent. It is not okay what these guys did and he needs to send the message to his team that they're not going to play in a Maryland uniform again. Well, I think uh, the precedent has already been set. Uh, we brought in a transfer over the summer, J.C. Jackson. Uh, he left the University of Florida uh, because he was charged uh, with four felony counts after a home invasion down there. Uh, we brought him in. Uh, Wes Brown is still on our team after being suspended uh, multiple times uh, in the past. He carried over the indefinite suspension from last year that Edsel had originally assigned to him, uh, and he's playing again for us this year. So I think that precedent is set, and I think it really just depends on how the legal process pays out or plays out. Um, Jackson was uh, eventually found not guilty of all his charges, and so you know I guess it depends on what uh, Turner and Harrison are are found guilty, not guilty. Um, but I do think we'll see them in a Maryland uniform again. So are you saying you agree with the precedent that you think has been set here? I agree that... You agree they, that, it, that it's okay for these guys to go out, get in trouble, no, and I go agree back that, No, I agree that if they are found not guilty, that they should, you know, be acquitted of charges in, you know, that sense. And if they're found not guilty, they should play in a uniform again. Just, you know, they did something dumb, but if they can't be found guilty in a court of law, there's no reason they should not be allowed to play again. I'm just going to say I hope that DJ Durkin makes the right decision and says to these guys, all right, you screwed up. It's time to go. But he's not the judge, jury, and executioner. He's not. He's not. But he needs to be the guy who sets the tone for this Maryland team, a team that's looking to head into a new direction, so, but if you're a saying team that's if looking to get away guilty, from the Randy Edsel era with those players like Wes Brown, J.C. Jackson. I know J.C. Jackson. So how does this, how does this look Durkin. to you, though? If they're found not guilty... He kicks them off the team. Then he set a precedent that he's just going to kick players off the team because he thinks they did something wrong. So you can't just kick players off the team if they're, you know. I think it sends the message that these players need to stay out of trouble and they need to be smart. I agree about that they have to stay actions. out of trouble. But if they are, if, they, if it ends up that they are found not guilty and nothing happens or the charges are dropped, then there's no reason for them to be kicked off the team. It's a tough decision and one that DJ Durkin will have to make. And keep in mind, he's a first-year head coach, so this decision could go a long way for the Maryland football program. The left bench will make sure to keep you updated on the situation. For Jared and Jared, we're sending it back to the desk. Thanks, guys. Now let's speed things up a bit with this week's Rapid Fire Recap. Let's stick with football. The Terps' losing streak continues. They fell to Nebraska this weekend 28-7. But the good news, they scored their first touchdown in nearly a month. They'll play Rutgers this Saturday with a trip to a bowl game on the line. Basketball season is in full swing. The men's team survived local rivals Georgetown and Towson this week to remain undefeated to start the year. For the women's team, it's been business as usual. They've won all four of their games by at least 32 points. The undefeated and top-seeded men's soccer team lost in heartbreaking fashion Sunday night, losing to Providence 5-4. Yeah, the Terps had a 4-1 lead but gave up four goals in the final 21 minutes and dropped that one. Field hockey suffered heartbreak as well. They were eliminated by North Carolina in the NCAA quarterfinal. Yeah, the wrestling team lost at a tournament down in Charlottesville. They'll head to the Big Apple for the grapple at the Garden this weekend. And finally, after beating Rutgers in straight sets, volleyball dropped two matches in a row. They'll close out this season this week at home. Staying on the court, TLB TV's Molly Hirsch had a chance to chat with volleyball head coach Steve Ayer this week. Here with head coach of the volleyball program, Coach Steve Ayerd. Howdy. How Howdy. Doing? So, Coach, big news this week. G. Milano was named Big Ten Freshman of the Week. Mm -hmm. How big has she been for the program this year? Yeah, she's a, she's a really good young player, very highly touted out of high school, recruited by almost everyone in the country. 
um, has come in, done a really good job. I think improved every week. Plays really hard. Great teammate, uh, great kid, and uh, we're very lucky to have her. So you talk about recruiting, and this year, actually, more big news. It's um, the 16th ranked freshman class. What kind of recruiting went into making this class possible? Well, I think it's always about relationships, you know. Um, when Gia committed, I think it got a lot of people's attention because they didn't understand, okay, why is one of the best players in the country going to Maryland for volleyball? They were just confused, right? But then what happened was it got people's attention, and we had some more kids visit, and they fell more and more in love with the campus, the school. I, I always tell the kids it's a, one of the top schools in the country. We're in an unbelievable location between D.C. and Baltimore. Uh, the volleyball plays in the best conference in the country. And we've, uh, as a staff, we've been able to produce some pretty incredible talent over the last 10 years. So if they wanted to go on and play in the national team or play professionally, we can help them get there. So it just kind of snowballed, and it's been really exciting. So this is your third year here at Maryland. Uh, you settled with your family of three kids. Um, how's that been for you, kind of juggling? It's kind of wonderful and wonderfully chaotic at the same time. How do you juggle your time there? I juggle it very easily because my wife's a rock star. I, they're, they're sweet kids. They, they've got a lot of energy, as uh, people who come to matches probably know. But, you know, I like to do my best to try to be a great, great husband, uh, great father. It's hard during the season because of time demands, but, um, you know, it's a, it, it makes me whole. So you're talented, and like you've said, the team is talented. You've propelled the team, the program, so far forward since you've been here. Where do you see the program going in the next 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I'm hoping to be good, you know, this weekend. That's a start. I think, uh, you know, I want to continue to recruit really good kids. Um, this year's class, the 2016 class, was our first full recruiting class. Next year's class, I think, is exceptional. Uh, over the next couple of years, we're going to be really, really good. And uh, the chances of me wanting to go anywhere are pretty slim because I think we're going to be really good and the kids kind of get me. And I love the DMV in this area, and I, I'm, I'm really proud to be the head coach of uh, Maryland Volleyball. Aired and Company will face Purdue on Wednesday and Indiana on Friday. Moving to the mats, wrestling head coach Kerry McCoy sat down with TLBTV's Noah Gross. Noah Gross here with coach Kerry McCoy of the University of Maryland wrestling team. Coach, you guys had a pretty up and down year last year. What's the biggest reason for optimism or the biggest change from last year to this year? Uh, what I've talked about with our team is the level of expectation, the level of acceptance, you know, the things that were allowed to happen last year or not being allowed to happen this year with the attitude, the, the, the commitment, the level of, of work. As far as your freshman class goes, which, one, which freshman are you specifically most excited about? We had a really good freshman class. We had a bunch of guys come in that were state placers, all Americans. Uh, Brandon Cray was a two-time state champ from New Jersey. He came in uh, top five, top six at his weight class, ranked nationally, so we were really excited for him. We had another guy that actually split matches with him, uh, Alex Vargas who won the, the match in the rest loss, and then this weekend at the Southeast Open, Brandon beat him in the competition. So two really good freshmen in that weight class. As far as talent already on the team, you can't talk about Maryland wrestling without talking about Alfred Bannister. Yeah, yeah. So what do you expect from him this year? You know, he's one of our, our captains. Uh, he was captain last year, he's a captain this year. So being a Maryland native, it's, it's, it's really cool to be able to be one of the, the most successful wrestlers ever to come out of state and then wrestle for the flagship university. So, you know, when you're that talented, it doesn't take a whole lot for you to you know, to, to go out there and get things done. You were in the Olympics in 2000 and 2004. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that experience. So, um, yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. It was uh, when I was a senior in high school, you know, really committed myself to making an Olympic team. 96, I was an alternate. I was, you know, third at the Olympic trial. And then coming back and competing in the next two games was, was really special. So words really can't explain what it was like to be in that in the competition in the arena. You know, it started off from winning the national championships to being the top seed at the Olympic trials and then winning the, the two out of three series, won two straight matches to make the team and just the excitement of making your first Olympic team and then going there to Sydney, Australia and going through what, what really captures it for me is through the time, you know, you talk about everyone wants to win a gold medal, wants to be an Olympic champion, but the idea of, of the process that it didn't matter. It was, it was, you know, the wrestlers and you had know, professional athletes, professional basketball players. Venus and Serena Williams were on the team. You know, Tim Duncan was on the team. Alan Houston. You know, all these superstars. And during the opening ceremonies, we were all together representing Team USA. The experience is really what it's all about. And then the, the being able to win a medal is, is really icing on the cake. But um, you know, to be able to be involved with the Olympic movement at, at every level has been pretty cool. And I'm, I'm excited to be able to share those kind of experiences anytime I can. Thanks, Noah. Well, we gave you your fix of Jared and Jared already. Now let's introduce our new duo. 
Alex and Alex here to talk some Maryland basketball. Well, nothing against Jared and Jared, but I have to say that I like this duo a little bit better. As do I. <laughs> so, Alex, you've been covering basketball all year, uh, the early part of this year, I should say. Uh, Mellow Trimble is a guy that's really carried this team so far, a guy that we weren't sure if he was coming back this year. You know, he d decided last minute to come back for the season. What have you seen from him this year? I mean, when you think about where the Terps and Turgeon could have been at the beginning of this year, they could have had their entire starting five just gone. I mean, Diamond Stone and Jake Lehman went on to bigger and better things in the NBA. Uh, Robert Carter Jr. and Rashid Suleiman testing the waters a little bit in international and, and the D-League. But, I mean, Mello is the face of Maryland basketball. He's a local product, and he, this team really lives or dies depending on how well Mello plays. And you can really see that in their offense this season because without him on the court, the offense is really stagnant. You have Anthony Cowan, a freshman point guard, who's you know coveted recruit and in his own sense is a great prospect, but he's still a freshman and this team needs the veteran leadership of Mello in that backcourt if they're gonna succeed. I mean, he's so far he's averaging 17 points per game, shooting 50% from the floor, and it's a lot different than the, the Mello we saw last year, who you know kinda got into a slump in the middle of the season and was really shot happy and that really hurt the Terps. But He's resorted to his freshman mellow, and that's the mellow that fans in College Park and Xfinity Center have loved to see. And you brought up Anthony Cowan. What about the other freshmen with Justin Jackson and Kevin Herter? The three of them have really been a great triple for the Terps this season, the three freshmen getting a lot of playing time. What do you expect to see from them the rest of the year? Well, Megan, this is honestly one of the most promising trio of freshmen in the entire country. I mean, when you look at Justin Jackson, he didn't even commit to the Terps until Mello's decision to stay for his junior year. And Jackson has been lights out for the Terps all season long. Against Towson, he was five for seven from three point range and really just couldn't miss. And Mello led the team in scoring against Towson, but like, make no mistake about it, Jackson was the one who propelled the Terps over the Tigers in that game. Herter has been a defensive beast and you know, Turgeon has called him the best shooter he's ever seen. And that's great regards considering someone who coached Jake Lehman, who's now in the NBA, is one of the better shooters coming out of the program. But Herder, a defensive beast, and Anthony Cowan, I mean, we might as well just call him Mello 2.0 from his freshman year. I mean, he exudes confidence, he's not afraid to pull from long range, and he drives the basket with authority despite his small stature. Yeah, and Cowan, he's got that uh, ambitious tattoo over his chest. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, Cowan's standing at six foot with shoes on, and he has an ambitious tattoo right across his chest to make sure he and everyone else knows that it's not about stature, it's how well you play. And he models his game a lot after Isaiah Thomas. And you can see that in the way he plays. He just plays with such passion and fire. Well, Cowan, a great player. Alex and Alex, a, a great, great duo. duo. And Megan as well <laughs> in, in here, uh, too. So I'm glad we have people with uh, good names coming on our show. You can follow Alex on Twitter at A underscore Little Tales. Um, and thank you again for coming on. Well, I mentioned the great names on our show. There were some big names in College Park this past week. ESPN president John Skipper was here, as well as Bentley's fan club president Scott Van Pelt. TLB TV was there at the event with the coverage. The Shirley Povich Center for Sports Journalism hosted its 11th annual symposium at the University of Maryland Wednesday night. The panel focused on the future of sports on television and included insight from Sports Center host Scott Van Pelt, amongst others. They're getting that content someplace else. There's a screen somewhere, whether it's a device, it's sling. For Van Pelt, it has always been important to come back to his alma mater and pass on his message to current Terrapins. Just to meet the next wave of people and to just share the passion I have for Maryland uh, with you guys. I'm always fond of saying we're all from somewhere and this is, and I'm from here. NBC Sports' Jimmy Roberts, another Maryland alum, mentioned he enjoys giving back to the school that gave him an opportunity. What I can offer is some perspective on what I went through and maybe give a little bit of advice that might be helpful so that um, eventually the world is in fact ruled by Terrapins. The event was a tremendous success and as senior broadcast journalism student Patrick Stoll noted, it surpassed lofty expectations. I mean, my expectations for like the Shirley Povich events are always really high. They always have an all-star lineup, and it always delivers. After the panel, we talked to SVP. He told us his biggest wish is for students to simply stay at the football games. If you go, stay. We've been down this road before, remember? I, I got so upset. I'm tired of being upset. Stop hurting my heart. I love you guys, and all you do is hurt me. What's that about? 
Well, here's something that might draw students to the stands. A local Maryland commit started this past weekend's WCAC title game right here at Maryland Stadium. Max Marcilla has the recap. A few Maryland Terrapin commits and several future recruits took the field in the WCAC football championship on Saturday when the DeMatha Stags faced the St. John's Cadets. One of three Maryland commits to play in the championship game was Kasim Hill, a four-star pro-style quarterback for the Cadets. Hill got things started early with a passing touchdown to freshman Rakeem Jarrett. Then, with the score tied at seven, Hill delivered another strike, this time to Ed Lee, to give the Cadets the lead. The senior quarterback still wasn't done. Another touchdown to Lee closed the books on an impressive first half for Hill. But after halftime, the tides turned following a fumble on a kickoff. DeMatha, which trailed 29-14 at one point, trimmed the deficit down to two. However, they could not convert a two-point conversion to tie the game at 29. But it was another quarterback, senior Air Force commit Bo English, whose touchdown pass to running back Miles Marie was the difference. I mean, I trusted the game plan. We had a, a you know, great calls all day from the coaching staff. And I trusted my whole line. They, they did a phenomenal job. And trusted my, my, my receivers on the outside, my running backs to make plays. And that's, that's exactly what we did. DeMatha has now won four consecutive WCAC championships. We knew that it was going to be very difficult to win a championship, let alone win four in a row. Uh, so credit to St. John's. They played a fantastic game. Uh, but this one was definitely the sweetest. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Max Marcella. We now have our director of recruiting coverage at TLB. Jake Brodsky in studio making his TLB TV debut. Welcome, Jake. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, it's great to have you on, Jake. Uh, looking at this past weekend's WCAC title game, Kasim Hill killed it, and we're expecting to see him in a Terps uniform soon. So can you tell us about what you saw from him? Yeah, I mean, he had a really, really good game. He threw three touchdowns and almost upset a DeMatha team that went undefeated for the first time in, I believe, around a decade. That team is stacked with D1 talent. But the biggest thing with Kasim is when we get here, he's going to be a spread passer. He's going to take some time to develop. Scouts know that, but he shows plus mobility and he has a good arm. So he'll be able to throw the ball, sling it around, and run a high power offense that we haven't seen for a long time here in College Park. And who's another recruit that Maryland fans can keep an eye out for? Well, to look out for someone coming, not this upcoming year, but the year after, Eric Gilliard is our first commit of the class of 2018. He's a middle linebacker prospect out of Florida. And Gilliard, I mean, I don't know what else to say. He lays the wood. It's the best way to put it. He brings the boom every time he is on the field. He's a little bit undersized height-wise. He's 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 That's a little small for a middle linebacker. But as a 16, 17-year-old, he's already 220 pounds. So you see him out there on the field. He's athletic, and he can just hit people. I think Jake made an excellent TLB TV Oh, yeah, debut. you killed it. I'm Thanks for having me, man. guys. It's an honor. Feel free it's to come honor. back anytime. Oh, I, I will be back. I'm <laughs> holding you to that. All right. Well, thank you. It's one of the most popular sports in the world, but not in America. Some students here at Maryland have taken it up in their spare time. TLB TV's Alec Perez gives us an inside look. One, two, three, four. Left on your left, on your left, on your left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though he has lived in three countries, junior Andrew Gelsinger says he's found a home here in Maryland. So it's been my dream to come here since I was like six years old. Um, I've always wanted to come here. But come game time, Andrew is locked and loaded. Rugby in the States is a lot more competitive than I'm used to um, because people want to win more and they're a lot more athletic. Like back home, you could just kind of go out and play around. Do it. The men's rugby team has players from Ireland, England, and Australia. But in each country, the word dropkick has no distinction. Rugby is more popular in other countries, but in America, the players seem to be faster, bigger, and stronger. Coming here, I used to be one of the quicker kids back at home, and I was just being put to shame. So I'm small for my position, so it's a lot harder to take all the contact. Despite bumps and bruises, his brothers are right there with him. If I didn't have the Maryland rugby team, I'd only know really other internationals. Get Getting over, comfortable get over, get with over. the squad, Andrew quickly became flat. a leader. We say weak, don't, don't swing it back. Just go straight to fucking. From Kenya to England to Maryland, Andrew can find refuge on the field he knows and loves so well. From the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, I'm Alec Perez. Terps Rugby is done with their fall season. They'll be back in action in the spring. Well, another episode of TLB TV in the books. But before we conclude, we have the one and only Juan Herrera in the studio today for our newest segment titled Juan Last Thoughts. So Juan, take it away. Thank you for having me. In the spirit of Thanksgiving, I'd like to say that I'm so thankful that the U.S. Soccer Federation finally decided to fire Jurgen Klinsmann 
After losses to Jamaica in the Gold Cup, losses to Mexico in Columbus, and losses to Costa Rica, it was time for him to go. And with the position now open, I think the best man for the job is right here at Maryland, and his name is Sasha Sarovsky. Hashtag Sasha to USMNT. Make it happen. Thank you. All right. Well, wise words from Juan, as always. And you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. Are you guys excited? Very so excited. excited. Can't Can't wait. Some turkey, some stuff. Stuffing is my favorite. Oh, oh yeah. Favorite. Not for me. No. I'm just turkey. Turkey, Juan. Mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes. All right. Well, I'm sticking with stuffing. But anyway, <laughs> thanks for watching TLB TV today. For Juan Herrera, for Megan Smedley, for the whole crew, I'm Alex Fulham. Have a fantastic Thanksgiving. And stay tuned for more coverage.